Can I get a show of hands? Is anybody considering going to the colloquium, Cochrane Colloquium in Santiago in the fall? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm definitely going. Um, and the reason I mention it is that we have a, a free registration available to somebody from our group for that meeting. And that is a um, value of about $1,400. So it's an expensive meeting to go to. So if you know of somebody who is going, please encourage them to contact. Patricia or me, we need to decide by the end of this month uh, who's going to utilize that free registration for us. Okay, so this is one of the primary things that the Cochrane Collaboration does, and that's create systematic reviews. And what systematic review authors do is that they identify the issues and determine the question that's going to be uh, analyzed and get the evidence is going to be gathered up for. Then they write a protocol which undergoes review and comments for how they're going to do their review. And the librarians here know about how complicated a review can be, how many things you can search for, how many languages you can look for. Then uh, the studies are searched. You search for the studies and then you sift and select which studies fit the protocol and those make it through the sieve here into the um, synthesizer. The data from those studies is extracted and then the quality of those studies are, is also analyzed. That's why randomized controlled trials are often so prominent in systematic reviews because that's our most unbiased form of uh, evidence usually for answering a clinical question. The data is combined, if possible, in some type of meta-analysis or synthesis, and then all of that is uh, published with discussion and conclusions in the systematic review. So all of that, all of those discordant triangles are nicely arranged in a set way so that we get a clear answer or know about the lack of an answer for a a question that's being asked about. And then the results of a systematic review are disseminated. So today we'll be talking about mentoring in two different aspects. One will be mentoring in this process of creating a systematic review. And that's what Patricia will be talking about. And then Olivia will be talking about one of the ways that we are doing mentoring in dissemination of the systematic reviews on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And here uh, we have their names, Olivia and then Patricia. And then there's also the CCTSI on campus has a mentoring network. And we have to figure out, I think, how we'll fit into that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know if they're listed as a mentor for our campus? I think I'm listed as a mentor in that network. I am. So that would be, uh, that would be something to think about uh, signing up for and mentioning your Cochrane experience, either in searching for evidence or doing systematic reviews or disseminating systematic reviews. Uh, there's also, I encourage you to encourage people to do this uh, interactive learning with 10 modules, and this should be available to people in our center uh, for free. And if it isn't, um, it's not okay yeah. so it might be it might be one thing that they're offering to us for, for setting this uh, oh. center up so we did have a, our first call with all the network directors in in the u.s and i would like to make this available for free at least for the people in this room uh, and who are active participants in our, our cochran u.s colorado mm -hmm. center so this is 10 modules of online learning that tell you all about uh, systematic reviewing and get you trained up for promoting yeah. Cochrane and uh, systematic reviews. And there's a great skill, and also you can add that to your CV as a mother. <laughs> so just to remind you of what we've got here, we've got the Cochrane U.S. Rocky Mountain uh, Center, or uh, more narrowly, the Cochrane U.S. University of Colorado Anschutz Campus Center. And uh, our, your team leadership is me, Bob Delavalle, and then Patricia the deputy director and the goals that we've set out for uh, doing our setting up a mentoring network promoting our dissemination of systematic reviews via wikipedia trying to have 
R13 meetings, which are NIH conference grants that support meetings of uh, Cochrane. One is already an application is in to bring the Cochrane Skin Group here next spring and March before the biggest dermatology meeting in the nation, which is the American Academy of Dermatology, which will be in Denver this spring. Uh, also to promote Cochrane to American medical society societies so that they fund fellowships to send their members to the Cochrane Colloquium and to learn about how to do uh, systematic reviews. And then we also have uh, Lisa Schilling and Andre um, working on um, IT collaborations with the Cochrane Library, intentionally. So again, our next lecture is next month. To remind you, put, you on that, put that on your calendar now for August 28th at noon here. And then also we're open to any future lecture suggestions. So if you know somebody who's doing something with evidence-based medicine on our campus, we have some lecturing opportunities for them uh, starting in August, September, mm -hmm. October, November, December. We'd like to get four more people to, to round out our year. Even if you don't have a project, but if you have a proposal of a project and you're looking for collaborators, so that would be a great platform too for you to present your project and uh, possibly develop a team. Again, uh, the Santiago uh, Colloquium is October 22nd to 25th. If you know of somebody going to that, we have a free registration that we have to determine who's going to get it by the end of July. So have them talk to us. <laughs> Again, here's that comparative effectiveness research meeting that will be happening on campus the 18th and 19th uh, for dermatology. And then I want to also inform you that uh, the U.S. Cochrane Network has put in a bid to host the Global Evidence Summit in 2021. So that's a um, like a mega meeting of Cochrane and the Campbell Collaboration and Guidelines International and the Joanna Briggs Institute. So those four institutes will be combining their annual meeting into one place that year. And uh, the network in the US is proposed to have that meeting in Washington DC in 2021. And we'll be hearing about the success or failure of that bid um, from those four organizations that are evaluating the bid now from the US and other countries. We'll hear about that bid um, shortly and I'll keep you informed. And again, just thanking all the people involved here, especially Patricia and uh, Olivia, who will be talking next. So Patricia will get your slides up here. And Bob, I have a question for uh -huh. the um, Skin Cochrane meeting. Is going to be any sessions that are like uh, more generalized to other disciplines that... Uh, yeah, there, there should be some broader uh -huh. uh, disciplinary talks on, on more general topics and I'll, I'll let you know what the agenda is um, shortly now that you've asked. <laughs> <laughs> I know we have it in our grant who we think is who we think we are going to uh, have speak and uh, if we get the grant funding we get to have them come and speak. If we don't get the grant funding then we have to rely more on local people mm -hmm. and we might open it up to a more general mm -hmm. uh, topics from our local audience mm -hmm. which we can bring in without as much money as speakers from around the nation, mm -hmm. more focused on Durham. So that's still up in the air until we hear about the status of the funding of the grant. Okay. I can certainly share with you the, um, the proposed agenda. And I want to also welcome everybody who's online with us today too. Yeah. So Lillian, I might need your help to get uh, okay. the next slide to show up here for Patricia. Do we have any questions at this point? <laughs> If not, I'm going to welcome Patricia to speak to us next. Okay. And I want to thank you, Bob, for the wonderful work. Uh, wasn't for him being so key, instrumental, and open this opportunity for our campus and for the Rocky Mountain region, we wouldn't be here today. And uh, that was such a, a fast development. I think like, uh, how long ago did we learn that we were actually approved to be an affiliated center? In yeah, maybe two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, has been quite uh, a big uh, milestone. And uh, so, Bob has been really 
wonderful in terms of uh, being able to provide that for us. And this is a great opportunity. So maybe one day we're going to have the, the Laval lecture evidence-based. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't get too carried away. <laughs> Recognize. Okay, so uh, about the mentoring. So as uh, any going back to the facts and evidence, uh, ideally what we would like to do is to develop this uh, possible mentoring program with the assistance from our own faculty from our campus. So we would like to develop some sort of survey or some tool that uh, we can evaluate the campus in terms of interest, in terms of commitment, in terms of support, and areas that uh, we feel like uh, our stakeholders and uh, our future collaborators uh, will like for us to expand and how going back to our affiliated center, how we can really support that. So at this point, uh, because uh, this is a big uh, new program we have Cochrane, so the motivation to make it successful is very high. So is the right time like to start to develop and think about new programs to add to our centers and also to make this intricate collaboration with the other centers around the country. So we have been working with the leadership, the US network uh, coordinator. They have also a person who is managing, who is directing the local collaboration that uh, is a full-time position supported by the Cochrane collaboration to really support those centers and really work together and make sure those centers will succeed. So talking about that since, uh, I don't know if we're gonna have slides or not, and it's not really important, but uh, just for you to know, like um, there is uh, motions, there has been movement for generating more mentoring, more opportunities within all the centers. So we're gonna be having a meeting in September with Michigan that uh, um, the, the, the center in Michigan, they submitted already on an R13 grant and is like an R13 in methodology, like to really train early career clinical scientists in those skills and those methodology and this open across all disciplines. So they have been quite successful in developing that um, NIH R13 sponsor grant that will support like fellowships and will support the training. So we talk about uh, the possibility to expand that to be a national uh, program within the collaboration. So if we can maybe start like with uh, those are 13, they vary from one year to three to five. So if we could kind of request a five-year plan and then each year will be a different center to get that training to bring to that local area, geographic area, the same possibility, the same opportunities. So we're going to be having the meeting uh, September to talk about that and then hopefully by maybe in the next September, meaning October, I have some updates about that possibility. But um, you know, those are going back and I age and funding cycles. So it takes uh, some time. So by the time we're gonna have the possibility in our center, it might take uh, for sure a year or even a little bit more. So, but uh, at least we are moving towards uh, that uh, direction. We also have some other possibilities coming up that's more like, uh, discipline based but they have also because you know when we're talking about evidence evidence based medicine all those methodologies and um, many of those skills apply to all the healthcare areas so with um, some of the movements with orthopedics and pediatrics they also want to establish like an evidence based center that's going to be an extension of the Cochrane or looking like how they can do that this is going to be in our campus and the children so they're also going to be providing technical assistance workshops that's going to be based on methodology so there has been interest there has been possibilities and i will keep you my job will be to keep you update and uh, offering you those opportunities and making them available. Um, I have prepared some of those basic slides, but I don't think I need to really go why it's important, why we need to be doing that. And uh, hopefully we are still working out those technical issues in terms of having our slides available at the uh, website. So we are, I don't know, Lillian and Bob, what's the status of that, or making those slides from our Cochrane lectures available? 
where people could download. And I, I think that's entirely possible. Okay. Yeah. As so long as you, you guys are okay with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's part of what we do, dissemination. So definitely we will be very happy to provide that. So I was very lucky that when I started to develop evidence-based medicine in the late 90s, uh, I had the opportunity to be in contact and have some training, especially with Dr. Goyat and uh, Dr. Sackett, and for some of us who has some uh, years in the field, uh, we have been in the, our early stages being trained by those gurus in the evidence-based medicine, and it uh, was such a nice, uh, very energetic time where evidence-based medicine really took over and uh, so many opportunities and training. So I was uh, so motivated as a trainee, I was a doctoral student, and then as a postdoc, so I had all this opportunity to really be um, trained by uh, our fathers and uh, appreciate the science. And uh, that leads me to more and more in terms of developing mentorship and uh, understanding how we can generate it, uh, products and uh, especially form science teams, evidence-based evidence practice science team to work towards those products which, which are those systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So, uh, in terms of uh, those uh, evidence-based steps, um, those are very uh, well known. Those are general and it has been more and more development, but that's what uh, our gurus, they started like to develop in terms of those concepts. Uh, those concepts now, they are so much more sophisticated and we have been developing tools now that really assist us. So there has been so many like guidelines from the PRISMA. Now we have the PRISMA checklist for systematic review or meta-analysis. We just last year, they launched the PRISMA scoping review checklist. And so we have been much more specific, much, much more technical and all those uh, specificity, those tools, those uh, quality procedures is part of that mentoring of that training. So of course I'm just bringing an overview here of how things have been really expanded. Uh, this was one of the groups that uh, in my early developments I was involved in. And, uh, so we funding and uh, all the changes, they also changed the name and the faculty, but they are still active and is a great uh, source also to look for materials. They provide books and um, PowerPoints and there has been a lot of uh, those, if you start to do some research, there has been a lot of uh, tools and uh, resources and manuals uh, available including from Cochrane that has a very heavy one. I know a lot of our mentees, it's not the best way to tell them to study evidence-based when you give that heavily thousands page with more than 20 chapters, uh, the Cochrane manual. I think that's like going over that prototype development of evidence base, but there is other materials that can really work to towards those initiated, initiated uh, activities and first steps. So Cochrane has developed a mentoring website and um, uh, for the time being, I'm not going to go over the website, uh, but uh, it's very easy to find. And uh, so they just uh, July 19 was the deadline for mentees and mentors to apply. So you could apply to have a mentor or as a mentee, so vice versa. Uh, you have to submit it. It was very uh, I would say direct. Uh, they just ask you why you want to be a mentee and why you want to be a mentor. Very simplistic. And then once they submitted, they had a phone call and then they're going to start to do the selection and then they're going to start like to match mentees with mentors. And that's going to be supported by Cochrane. So there's no funding, uh, there's no financial assistance, but that's like is there is resource assistance. So I think it's a program that we will see how that's going to go. It's new and we're very excited and I myself a mentor and uh, so yes, signed up. Yes, sign okay. up, yes. So we will keep you informed and uh, next cycle we let you know and we would love to have more of our campus participating in that uh, either as a mentor or as a mentee. 
So this is part of that uh, knowledge translation mentoring scheme. And so the idea is to develop products. And uh, so we, we'll, as I said, it's new. I don't have much information at this point. It's a new development, but it's also very exciting for us. Okay, about our center here. So I have a big wish list and um, it's always good to start big and then we can see what areas we can really start to implement uh, earlier or later. But um, I think there are so many possibilities, like with so many of these new programs growing. And like I said, you know, the kids orthopedics has an interest and dermatology and with CCC, CCTSI. So I think we can start to be more integrated and improve communication and uh, start like to develop some uh, bridges in terms, especially like in terms of bringing um, guest lectures that have that background. Because that also is something that cross over all the areas here in the campus. So whenever we have some of those uh, being special lectures, we can suggest that um, why we don't add some of those uh, evidence-based um, methodologists and the practitioners to come to the campus, deliver a lecture, spend some time, and then we can push them to also participate in our Cochrane and do another lecture. So I think we can um, leverage some of those initiatives that already we have funds that the campus already is in, has in place in bringing those guest lectures. As I said, uh, those technical assistance workshops, uh, they are now very active and uh, Bob just submitted one, was working towards one. Um, we're gonna be working with the Cochrane Center to have a larger one that's gonna be out through the networking. Um, we mentioned and we were still not, uh, uh, I would say in place to have those conversations, but it is in our pipeline to talk to the CCTSI on some of the initiatives to have some pilot funding to develop those projects because always the idea is that evidence base is kind of that literature review so you don't need funding you just need to devote your time and as, as a scholar you're supposed to do that but in reality we know that that's not how you conduct good quality evidence-based practice so having those pilot funds, uh, some initiation of support, especially for the librarians and um, for research assistants to include students in the projects or trainees, where they're gonna be learning about those uh, data extraction methodology and data management. And those sometimes like we have uh, we generated really large data. So just learning about these large data sets and how we can organize and utilize properly when we are synthesizing and uh, uh, bringing that data into the context of synthesis and the reporting. So there's uh, so many concepts that are so in depth. So really uh, trying to work towards some pilot fundings and uh, could be like mentoring pilot fundings, but uh, it's something that we will, like I said, we are only two months old. So we have uh, goals and uh, milestones and we're gonna be working towards that. And uh, uh, my specialty is in developing science teams. So I do work uh, nationally and internationally and I bring like groups together in any area and I instruct and mentor the group in using the methodology. So even if it's not my area of expertise, I contributed by those procedures, by bringing the staff and the skills, because those skills, like I said, apply to any area. So I have been doing that for more than 10 years and right now I still have a few of the groups working. Um, I was so lucky to be able to collaborate with Lillian. So Lillian and I, we are involved in many of those national and international groups. They keep us quite busy, but uh, they were very successful in terms of delivering products. So we have a few papers published and a few on the pipeline. and. Uh, so those are great because they are like national, like uh, professionals or international. So the science team really takes a big input in developing the expertise. And uh, so I also would like to bring that to our own campus and start like to form those teams here. That way they can work towards those products and achieving those. And uh, as Bob said, it's so critical for us, uh, not only like to mentor and train and develop those teams and 
uh, establish their presence at the campus, but then also showcase, have their presence in our professional societies. So bridging that, expanding, that's how we are going to really establish our campus, our career as a quality evidence-based practitioner. And uh, so that's my overall uh, goal, but uh, the idea of the meeting today, and as we are developing, we are like always trying to be very inter interactive because a center is uh, membership, so it's participation. So it's for you, it's for this campus. So we wanna just see like how we can serve, how we can facilitate your needs, what can we do to help you at this stage and how we can move forward. So at this point, I'm just gonna open for your input and um, this is your center. So what, what can we do if you have suggestions? Uh, we can also help in generating meetings and sub-meetings uh, for groups to work together and help to do some coordination, some mentorship with that. Yeah, maybe we'll try to get Olivia's uh, presentation loaded okay. while you're answering well, yes. any questions. Yeah. Any suggestions like... Uh, no. I, I yes. I, I guess I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> nursing has a PhD program and the Doctor of Nursing Practice program. The PhD students do systematic reviews of the literature to prepare for their dissertation. The DNP students do collect the evidence to guide their practice improvement project. Mm -hmm. It seems like your expertise would be brilliant to um, talk with those two groups. And I actually have them together in a course in the fall. Um, but I'm not sure what, you know, that second bullet seems to jump out at me. If, if you'd like to partner with nursing on mentoring some of our doctoral students, I'd love to have you. We would love that. So we would love actually even to include that as part of one of our projects. Yeah. So it would be great that so some of those projects will come back to the conference and we can do those presentations that show some of the projects that are out. So I think we can definitely give, that's exactly what we're supposed to do, is to bridge this center with what is already in place and the development and the student development. So that's when we talk about that. And let's see how we can have that as one of our affiliated, affiliated center programs. And uh, so I think that's great. We will be very interested in that. So thanks for sharing other things. <laughs> Okay, I think we have uh, Olivia's slides up, so we'll have Olivia present and then we'll take more questions. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia Hutton. I'm a third year medical student here at CU Andrews. And um, I've been working on this project improving Wikipedia articles, specifically on skin diseases, using Cochrane Reviews. And I'm going to talk to you about that today and also how um, mentorship plays into that process. Um, so the first thing you might wonder is why Wikipedia is important for dermatology, and this can also be applied to any area of medicine or healthcare. And the reason is that patients increasingly are looking to the internet for health information, and we know that information on the internet is not always as accurate and up-to-date as we would like it to be. And when they do studies about um, search results for healthcare search terms, Wikipedia articles are often among the first things that come up in a search result. So it's very likely that your patient will see a Wikipedia article about their condition before they ever come into the office and ask you questions about it. So Cochrane recognized the importance of Wikipedia in 2014 and they started the Cochrane Wikipedia Partnership. And their goal is to ensure that evidence-based health content is shared on Wikipedia. Here at CU, uh, we started the Cochrane Skin Wikipedia Editing Project. Um, so we recruited medical students and um, they were provided with a Cochrane mentor. So they learned how to edit Wikipedia to um, seek out the right sources and especially to use Cochrane resources to improve Wikipedia articles on skin disease. 
And as a medical student, this has been a really great learning opportunity um, because we're able to sort of become experts in the subject matter of whatever article we're working on and we're able to read the Cochrane review in a lot of detail and improve the Wikipedia article. And so really learn a lot in the process. So over the past, a little more than a year, um, we've incorporated most of the Cochrane skin reviews into Wikipedia in some form. Um, so 40 Wikipedia articles are, have been edited to be improved and to include Cochrane reviews. And we continue to update Wikipedia articles as Cochrane publishes new skin reviews um, so that we can stay up to date. This is a slide of our impact that we've had. Um, so since May 2018 when we started the project, the articles that we edited on Wikipedia have received 14.6 million views. So it's a lot of exposure for um, the information that we added, particularly the Cochrane reviews. A new project that we're working on is um, with Wikipedia, it's the Wiki Journal of Medicine. And this is an open access peer-reviewed peer journal um, that allows people to contribute to articles in their area of expertise and um, get them published. So it's basically a Wikipedia article that has been heavily edited to raise it to the level of an academic journal. Currently, we're working on the article um, for leprosy. And you can see this anytime if you look at the Wikipedia page for leprosy. Um, we're making a lot of edits to it. And we chose this one because it's um, one of the highest viewed skin articles on Wikipedia with over um, 1 million views per year. So we know it's important to the global community that's viewing Wikipedia. And we've had contributions from leprosy experts all over the world who want to help us improve the article. And so once it gets to a level of an academic paper, we'll, we'll be submitting it to the Wiki Journal of Medicine. So in addition to um, being able to contribute to scientific knowledge, this is also a really great opportunity for us to engage in mentorship. Um, so I was the first medical student involved with this, but um, we've been able to recruit a lot of other medical students. Um, some are fourth years who are on a rotation in dermatology from all over the country. Um, we've actually had a few international medical students reach out to us who just encountered the project online and want to be involved. And so um, for each student, we train them, we give them um, the modules that Wikipedia and Cochrane provide to learn how to edit and um, what Cochrane is and how to read those reviews. And as our project has grown, we've got some more sort of satellite projects arising. Um, some students are taking on those projects um, and leading them. So for example, I don't speak Spanish, but we want to start a, um, well, we are starting a project where we're editing Wikipedia articles in Spanish using the Cochrane Spanish reviews. So another medical student has taken on that project and is leading that now. And we've also been provided a lot of mentorship from Cochrane. Um, they have a Wikipedia consultant, um, Jenny Dawson, who has been doing most of the training and outreach. So what we're hoping to do in the next steps, um, we encourage all um, dermatologists and other healthcare professionals, trainees and students to um, participate in this project of Wikipedia editing and um, also the new Wiki Journal of Medicine articles. And we are also, as I mentioned, um, trying to get this project started for other languages um, so we can expand the reach of this project. And this is um, the training module that we have active right now if anyone is interested in getting started with Wikipedia editing. Thank you so much. That was great. So the only process is you have to sign up um, with a Wikipedia username and you have to join our um, project. So that would be part of the module, but um, we could also send you a link to do that. So once you um, start editing, there are people who look at all the edits that are made to medical articles in particular. One of those people is um, Dr. James Heilman. He looks at almost every medical article um, that's been edited. So if they don't agree. Here or 
there, so Dr. Harlan is in Canada, I believe, okay. and there's others. He he runs this whole organization that basically um, watches medical articles and you know looks into any edits that are made, and if they don't agree with them, they just reverse them. Is anyone able to go in and edit those articles? Yeah, so technically anyone can do it. However, so do they, like, take out your work? they do. So even a lot of edits that I make, they'll take them out <laughs> if they don't agree. Just What's like that? a random person? No, it's it's Dr. Um, Heilman or oh. one of his team will do I'm that. I'm talking about like someone that just feels like it's up on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody could do that. Work. Yeah, but okay. they'll, they're, every um, edits that's made, there's a version saved of what came before. So they can always revert to whatever version was before that. What are some of the guiding principles for the type of edits they're looking for, or the information they want in mm -hmm. Wikipedia articles? So one of the biggest ones is that the sources have to be um, review article type sources. So you can't add um, clinical trials or anything that hasn't had a, a lot of peer review. Um, so that's that's the biggest thing that they look for, I think. Um, also, anything without a citation, of course. Um, anything that's really outdated. Um, there's a whole list of sort of what right. they're looking for. So how long it takes? Like, how long you have been doing that? And what has been your effort in developing this? How long have I been doing it? Yes, like how many hours? How long? Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so for me, I mean, it's varied. I'm a med student, so my schedule is kind of all over the place. <laughs> but the nice thing about this project is that it's not incredibly time intensive, especially given the outreach and the um, sort of the impact we can have with a minimal sort of time commitment. So a lot of the med students that rotate through, they're able to just spend a few hours improving an article, and um, you know, suddenly they have they've reached a couple million people with that, which is pretty cool. And how is the authorship established, like your? So there's not a formal authorship for, for Wikipedia articles. Like you couldn't really put your name on it, um, but you could put it on your resume and say, you know, I helped edit this article. And um, we've taken, so for the Wiki Journal of Medicine articles, that would be different. That would be more like a traditional paper where there's authorship. And we've also um, published some of our findings um, in the Journal of the, Academy, Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, so there are ways to make it into an authorship project. Um, when, how is the regular uh, article on leprosy in Wikipedia going to be linked or connected to the Wiki Journal of Medicine article on leprosy when it's mm -hmm. done? I'm not actually sure. Um, I don't think that's quite been established yet, but I think that there will be a link um, on the Wiki, um, the Wikipedia article leading me to that published article. You um, mentioned that you have a content expert that's in Canada, but mm -hmm. do you also have content experts here that you work with mm -hmm. before you actually plug something in? Yeah, um, not so much for the normal um, Wikipedia articles. We're able to get that information from published journals and so on, but for the Wiki Journal of Medicine article, like for the leprosy one, um, there's another med student, uh, Mayra Fourth Year, who's mainly authoring that, and she's been reaching out to leprosy experts all around the world, um, and they've been happy to contribute. And so we've really, um, we've been able to reach a lot of experts in the field. She's actually not a, a med student, but a physician from Brazil, who now lives in the U.S. Hmm. There's a thing about how systematic reviews and clinical care guidelines fail. Usually it's not the review or the guideline itself. I think that reviews fail on knowledge translation dissemination. If you write a beautiful review, it's just in a journal that's behind a paywall. 500 people read it, 480 of those forget it. Right? <laughs> You've got almost half a million views per page that you edited. Clinical guidelines, guidelines I think, fall down on stakeholder involvement. They're written by one group of people for a different group of people that never gets asked, and then there's yes. a good thing, and dissemination. So if, if you were interested in a topic, really wanted to be a thought leader, and how would you incorporate this kind of stuff into making sure that all the hard work you put at the front end actually translates? 
if you were the author. This is like wicked awesome. I just, <laughs> 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 uh, well, anybody could get involved in this project. You don't have to be a med student or a doctor or anything. So, um, yeah, if you had the right sources to add and they were approved by the uh, Wikipedia team, I think you could you could improve whatever article you wanted to. Have you looked at the relationship to the Wikipedia articles and guidelines in that way? Do you think there's room for educating guideline developers about this development in Wikipedia articles that might make them a higher standing in their view? Or importance yeah. with regard to the dissemination? Mm -hmm. uh, there are of that often down and, um, um, Well, the training modules go over a lot of that, um, so how to make the best edits. And also Wikipedia keeps a score basically of each article that's that goes from, you know, like not developed to very good article. And so um, and those are the ones that will end up like on their front page. Um, so there are there are guidelines from Wikipedia and there's guidelines from Cochrane. So yeah, we could probably work on combining those a little more where we get the Wikipedia articles to a high level. You might consider an outreach to Guidelines International and just presenting them what you've done. Mm -hmm. Guidelines International? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the organization that kind of helps develop guidelines and compare them internationally. Mm -hmm. And how many students were involved in this project? It's been a lot at this point. Um, at least 10, I think more. Yeah. Um, and then other, other people as well. Um, and you from other positions. Is it tied to the course or the program expectations your involvement? Currently not. Um, there is somebody I've been meeting with um, who's developing a course on social media in the School of Medicine, and he's interested in having this be a, an assignment or a final project for his students. Hmm. This is sort of an optional uh, assignment for medical students working in the dermatology department. Oh, okay. So they can do it as an optional. And how long you have been involved with that now? Uh, a little over a year. Yeah. I, I think part of the adoption of this is going to be a generation of people who embrace crowdsourcing. I mean, people who create guidelines are generally at the top of their field and are going to be older in their community, likely. And some of them, while they are embracing that, it's, it's going to take a little time and it's going to take med students to yeah. see the impact, the, the potential impact. Yeah. But obviously it's happening. Yeah. It's great. It's great, yeah. And there have been some studies that the like Cochrane systematic reviews are the most referenced uh, medical source in Wikipedia currently, above the New England Journal and JAMA and all that. Thank you, Olivia. Yes. So um, that brings us to the close of our noon hour today. Thank you all for coming today. I hope you learned something, and I hope you'll come back again on August 28th for our next noon lecture with Lillian and Lisa telling us about how to find the best evidence for doing systematic reviews and answering uh, evidence-based questions about healthcare decision-making. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>